We are looking forward to the spaghetti, by the way. Uh, first, I just want to thank you all so much for the kindness uh, that you've shown us. Uh, over the last few days and just in the months prior leading up to this, uh, Jules and I have just experienced so much warmth and kindness from you all. Um, all your help, your gifts, your kind words have really gone a long way and meant a lot to us. Uh, we just, Brian was asking me the other day at the bowling alley, he was like, hey, are, are you sure you're like, uh, you're, you're feeling good about everything? I just, I just want to double check. And there's, there, there's, there's no shadow of doubt that this is exactly where, where we need to be. And so uh, I was talking with, uh, with Carolyn Slack in the lobby earlier, and we both just kind of agreed. It just feels like I, we've already been here for so long, just kind of the way we feel like we already know you. And so um, we're just really excited about what's coming and serving Christ in this church. Um, and so I wanted to thank you just for trusting me, trusting me to be your pastor. Uh, I'm I'm, I'm here to lead to, and then shepherd this flock. Uh, I want to see us all moving and walking the same journey uh, towards Christ together. And so I'm here to preach and live out the word, word and, and see that, that rise up among all of us. Um, I want you to know that I, I'm trusting myself to you as well. You know, I'm not just your pastor. I want to be your friend. And so um, I want to open up my life, my, my wife and I want to open up our lives to you, even the parts which are a little bit messy, which, which are imperfect. Uh, if you need any evidence that I'm imperfect, I believe Linda has a recording of me bowling from last night. If you bribe her and let, let her show you that, then that should wipe away any fear you have of having a perfect pastor because... I think I'm pretty, I'm pro oh, you know what, I'm, I'm probably glad that the power lines went out because I wasn't looking forward to tallying up our scores and finding out that at the end of the night with both games combined, I still was only two figures. <laughs> oh, I get you. But anyway, just simply put, Jules and I are so excited. There we go, is that better? Yeah. Jules and I are so excited. We're excited to see what God is going to do in and through the people of Calvary over the next, uh, ne oh, in this next season. Um, I hope you are too. Um, today, the text is Matthew 21, uh, verses 1 through 11. Today, I wanted to talk, just, you know, share a simple message today on, on, on this Palm Sunday, celebrating the first day of Holy Week, celebrating um, Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem, uh, where Jesus and his disciples are approaching Jerusalem for Passover feast. Um, and what I, I want to look at today in this clear message is, is the kingship of Jesus. And we see here in this text, Matthew 21, I think we see a crystal clear picture and declaration of Jesus' kingship. And so if you'll turn there with me. Matthew 21, verses 1 through 10. Will you please stand for the reading of God's word? Matthew 21, ver uh, verses 1 through 11, read this. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Uh, this is the perfect, inerrant word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for bringing us here to fellowship with one another, to study and meditate on your word, to worship you and glorify and, and sing out your name, Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, O oh, save, O oh God, the Davidic Messiah has come, Lord. Uh, as, we, as we celebrate that today, this Palm Sunday, Sunday and this Holy Week, we, we celebrate Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, Lord. Let us, let us truly understand the identity of Christ today. Let us understand his kingship. Let us understand the significance of this God-man who came to die in our place, Lord. What that means for us, what it means for eternity. Uh, Lord, please bless this message today. Let my words and thoughts be your words and thoughts. We pray this together in the name of the Son and by the Spirit. Okay, you may be seated. 
Well, today we're talking about Jesus' kingship, and the first thing I want us to see from this text, verses 1 through 6, we see that Jesus declares his own kingship. Uh, we see Jesus riding in on a donkey and a colt, a humble picture of a king, right? Because whenever you think of a king, why, why, why would you think of a donkey and a colt? That's kind of the obvious question, right? You would maybe think of a, a horse, maybe a war horse or something, right? Something more prestigious. Why something humble like this? Well, Matthew is very clear in verse 4. He says that it's, he specifies that it is to fulfill Scripture. There's this prophecy in Zechariah 9.9 9, to say that the king is coming. You see that here in verse 5. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And so I like being involved in kind of the world of apologetics and so whenever I'm going to different apologetics meetings you'll see a lot of people from different religious or irreligious backgrounds you know Muslims Jews atheists that are highly toxic anti-christian all of them by the way being super skeptical of anything Bible related right and I'll hear a lot of times whenever I'm in these circles people casting doubt about the words of Jesus casting doubt saying things like well Jesus never declared himself to be the Messiah. He never said he was, you know, the son of God, the king of kings, all that sort of stuff. His followers just came in after the fact. They deified him. They made the whole thing up. Well, if you look at this text, I mean, you just, you don't have to read that hard to realize that that entire argument just blows up. Jesus is a smart guy. He knows what he is doing. He's intentionally, by this act of fulfilling this, this prophecy in Zechariah, he is declaring himself to be this Davidic Messiah talked about here. Um, he, even in verse 3, you might notice, he refers to himself as the Lord. And so what I want you to see all throughout verses 1 through 6 is Jesus does declare himself as the king who is prophesied. He declares his own kingship. Furthermore, we continue reading. Verses 7 through 9, the thing I want you to see here is that not only Jesus, but the people surrounding Jesus, the people who are seeing him, his followers, the people in Jerusalem, they are also declaring his kingship here. And so the disciples, you notice, they put their cloaks over the colt and donkey that Jesus can sit on. They cut down branches. They laid it in the road. The people in the streets, they laid out their cloaks before him for the animals to step on, preparing the way for Jesus. Have you ever heard of someone rolling out the red carpet for someone? You know, if there's, you know, a celebrity event, you know, it's a red carpet event, you know, you've got movie stars, big name, you know, celebrities coming out. They roll out the red carpet, so as they're stepping out the limo, a way is prepared for them. The pap paparazzi can take all the photos, all that kind of stuff, right? Or, you know, if a, the president, someone of, of, of well renown is coming, you roll out the red carpet for you got to get the red carpet out, right? Uh, I don't know who's supplying all the red carpet. I'm sure it's a booming industry. But anyway, the red carpet's out there, right? What does the red carpet mean? Well, it's to show honor. It's to show respect. It's to show that this is someone who is significant. And this is, this is basically what these followers are doing by, by laying their cloaks out, by laying the branches on the road. They're saying that this is someone significant that we need to pay attention to. Uh, a few weeks ago, my lovely bride, Juliana, sitting in the front row, cutest redhead in the world, uh, she walked down the aisle. It's the most beautiful sight I've ever seen. But before she walked down the aisle, we had a flower girl that walked in front of her and, and laid ro rose petals at, at her feet to prepare the way. Or at least that's the way it was supposed to go. The, the two-year-old that we had walking down the aisle was so like taken back by all the people in the crowd staring at her that she walked all the way down the aisle. Not a single rose petal was thrown. <laughs> We prepared ahead of time. There were some preset rose petals, though. We thought it might be, might be a situation. But the idea is there, right? The idea is that these people are trying to honor Jesus. They're recognizing that this is someone truly special. These cloaks, it symbolizes their submission to this figure. Their submission to, this, to Jesus as king. The branches themselves, actually, the palm branches, they had quite a bit of significance to the nation of Israel. They're often associated with military victories, kind of, it was a symbol of almost 
Israel itself, a, a kind of a state of nationalism, nationalistic victory, a state of victory. And so the idea is that Jesus is coming, and they're expecting him to usher in this, this season, this, this state of victory for the nation of Israel. And so they sing and shout, Hosanna. Hosanna means, oh, save. They talk about him being the son of David. And so by saying this, they are acknowledging him as this Davidic Messiah who is foretold who is to come. And so just picture it. Just picture it with me for a second, right? Because sometimes it's easy to just think of them in words on page. Picture the gates of Jerusalem, right? Picture Jesus walking in, the crowds coming before him. He's mounted on a, a, on a donkey. He's got cloaks on top of him. There's cloaks on the road, palm branches on the ground. People are swinging it. People are saying and singing, Hosanna you know, uh, son of David, the Messiah King, Hosanna in the highest. That's the picture you see here. This was not just a, a superficial show, show of support. This was a genuine, a genuine expression of people's faith and hope in this figure. Not only Jesus, but the people also saw and declared that Jesus was King. Okay. And so, if Jesus is king, if both Jesus and the people declared it, the question becomes, what kind of king is he? Uh, verse 10, you see this question kind of initially, initially posed. Uh, in verse 10, it says, uh, what, the question is asked, who is this? Who, who, who is this person? Well, the expectation of the people, and you might have gotten a little hint of this before, is that Jesus is coming. The people of Jerusalem are looking forward to a Messiah who would save them from their enemies. They were looking for a military conqueror king, someone who would overthrow the Romans, who would establish a new kingdom. And maybe that's the reason why there was such a stir, you see, in verse 10, was because the religious establishment was feeling threatened. If this person is coming for this purpose, they might get in their own way. However, they were a little bit off about what kind of king he would be. They were correct that he would usher in a new kingdom, but they were wrong about what kind of kingdom it would be. They did not understand the truth of John 18. John 18, 36 says that his kingdom is not of this world. His mission was far greater than just political liberation. It wasn't just earthly. It wasn't just for that time. It was eternal and it wasn't just localized specifically to Jerusalem. It was for the entire world, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles also. And so they didn't understand the scope of what Jesus was bringing. They were surprised they didn't understand it at all. Jesus came to die. That was what they didn't understand. He came to die and offer that free gift of life that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal lives so long as they surrender their lives over to him. They believe in his name and have life in his name. And so I'll just take a moment to say, if you do not know this Jesus, this Jesus who the people declared as king, who he himself declared as king, if he is not your king, I want you to know you can be saved today. Talk to me today, because he has given us the most tremendous gift himself. He has given us himself that we may have life in his name. And it is truly a matter of life and death. And so there is an urgency, an urgency we ought to have as we talk about this gospel that we've been given, about the eternal life we've been given. Uh, a few months ago, whenever I preached, I preached about the death that we lived in before we came to know Christ if we are Christians. If you are not a Christian today, know that you are sitting in death. You are dead in your sins and trespasses, and that Jesus is the answer. And that this declaration is not just a declaration temporally for this time, but a declaration for eternity about Jesus' identity. The reason Jesus had such a lonely death, you think just a week later, right? Sunday's coming. It's because people loved their own ideas about who Jesus would be more than the actual person of Jesus. We can sometimes get caught up with that as well, where we were really fond of our own ideas, our own personal Jesuses, right? The Mormons have their own Jesus. The Jehovah's Witnesses have their own Jesus. If you go to a few different Christian denominations, you'll see a very different Jesus represented and talked about than maybe what you'll see in other congregations. Even here in this room, we probably have different concoctions in our minds of how we think about Jesus. And that isn't necessarily wrong in every way, but we need to be clear and make sure we're biblical about how we think about this figure who is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
He wasn't exactly what the people wanted, and so they rejected him. Most turned away from him. Very few were there whenever he died. Therefore, we have to recognize, we have to look at God's word and see exactly who Scripture says he is. I said after we, we, after we read the text that this is the holy, inerrant, and perfect word of God, and that is true. We can, we can have assurance about who Jesus is from these, these words here. We have to pay attention especially to the parts that we may not like that it says about Jesus. Uh, because there is only one Jesus. And if we follow him, if we commit to give our lives to this person, we can't just follow a part of him, the parts which are comfortable to us. We have to follow all of him. And we have to do all of what he calls us to do. And so this is what I want you to know as we, as we go to our, our time of response in a second. Jesus is king. He is not just our, you know, warm and gushy friend, although it's not wrong to think of him like that, but he is our Lord. He is our Lord. We have seen how the people here have responded to this reality. That, and although they were wrong about the kind of person he would be, they responded faithfully. They recognized his kingship. And so the question is, we've seen how they responded. How do you respond to this reality? <laughs> uh, Jules and I, we, uh, for our honeymoon, we took a, took a little cruise. And uh, as we were preparing for our cruise, we, went, we were going to a few different uh, places, a couple cities in Mexico, and uh, we were going to Belize City as well. And so it was our first time on a cruise. We saved up for it, and it was a really, really good time. However, as we were preparing for the cruise, she was incredibly adamant about one thing. We are not, not drinking the water there. Because she heard some horror stories, some horror stories about people who go off, they go to a different country, they try the tap water, or the bottled water, or whatever there, and they get horribly, horribly sick, okay? Because either there's like new, different kinds of minerals there, or different bacteria, I don't know what the deal is. Anyway, she was very adamant, right? I had to really talk her into bringing refillable water bottles, because she didn't even want to bring like, drink the water on the cruise ship, right? She wanted to bring the cases. Then we discovered it was like 40 bucks per case of eight bottles, and we were like, okay, maybe, maybe we can actually bring the refillable water bottles and we were good we were good we we, we kept it if we we're going on excursions on shore uh, we made sure to fill up our, our water bottles and only drink from that uh, even if there was a, <laughs> even if there was a if, even if we had drinks if there was any ice in the drink she was extra cautious and stressed out because she was like I don't know where this ice ice is coming from maybe this isn't safe for us to drink um, but we were all good we were fine despite her, her concern um, until day four. Day four was our trip to Belize. And so we did this incredibly, incredibly beautiful thing in Belize. We went cave tubing. And so I don't know if you've ever gone floating down a river in like one of those donuts, one of those tubes, but we were able to do that through an underground cave system. It was a crystal cave system. And so it was incredibly beautiful. It was out in the jungle. Um, and so we're going down. It's dark. We got the headlamps on. We're looking around. Um, what, what a sight. We're seeing all these different cool rock formations and whatever. And as we're all kind of linked together on these big donuts floating down on the river, um, we see this stream of water coming down from the rocks. And so our tour guide's talking about this stream of water and how special it is to the people here. He splashes us playfully a couple times with the water. And I hear the most audacious request of my entire life from behind me. I, Jules screams out, uh, hey, can I drink the water? <laughs> and I thought I heard her wrong, and so I turned around, and there she is with the biggest smile on her face, wanting to drink the cave water. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but what, it, what it was, I teased her quite a bit afterward about that. But, um, but what it was is once she saw there, and once she saw how cool it was to be there with, the, you know, the stream of water or whatever, uh, she totally forgot about her, her previous concerns, right? And so the reason I bring that up is because maybe you have ruled out a way that God desires to use you in his body. As we begin a new ch chapter of Calvary, I think it's the most appropriate time now to say um, there may be a way that you will soon be prompted to serve and lead to which maybe you've said no a million times before. Um, maybe you've said, eh, well, this just isn't right. This, is, this isn't really my thing. I'm not good at this. I don't want to do this. 
But ask yourself, just, just take a moment in humility and ask, am I recognizing Jesus' kingship over my life in this? Is this truly a, a response which is, which is holy and righteous according to God's will? Are you willing to step outside your comfort zone in order to be obedient and following Jesus and the, whatever the promptings of the Holy Spirit are in your life? And so whether that's sharing the gospel with a neighbor, whether that's leading in some capacity, maybe on a, a Sunday morning, maybe that's just taking another member of our congregation out for coffee and prayer. Are you willing to respond and be obedient to Jesus calling over your life and whatever that may be? Or maybe, maybe the situation is more dire than that. Maybe you just have, maybe you've ruled out Jesus entirely. Maybe you've rejected him over and over again saying, no, 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 no. Yet you still find yourself in this Christian circle, but you truly do not belong to him. I want you to know today that you should be listening to what the Spirit is saying inside of you. See what God is showing you. Because perhaps whenever you truly look at it, whenever you see it clearly in front of you and you see how beautiful it is, you can't help but just say almost in desperation, can I drink the water? But it's not some nasty cave water. It's the living water of Christ. It's the living water which in John 4, Jesus says, it, it becomes in you a spring of water welling up to eternal life. To drink of it is to give ourselves totally over to him. Being a Christian is not just saying, well, I trust Jesus as my Savior, and then we just live life however we want. We cannot accept Jesus as the Savior over our lives whenever we do not submit to, as the submit to him as the king over our lives. The people in this text, they saw Jesus as both their deliverer, Savior, and their king. They were wrong about what kind of deliverance he would bring, what kind of kingship he would bring, but they did see him that way, and they made that righteous declaration. And whenever we see him rightly as the King of kings and Lord of lords, it is going to affect how we live. And so the question is, do you see Jesus as the Messiah? In how we praise him, as we serve him, as, as we speak about him, do we see him rightly in our lives? Do you live like Jesus is the powerful King of kings and Lord of lords? Not only do you, do you think it, but do you live like it? Because it's not just to know enough about him, to have head knowledge, to have a great theology. All that stuff is good. But what's so more important is whether your life declares it. Does your life declare the kingship of Jesus? Jesus declared it. These people declared it. Do you declare, not only with your words, but with your life, how you live? See, we must be known by him. And we must know him. And the one who knows him follows his commandments. We who know the truth follow him and do as he commands because he is our king and we serve him dutifully. Not as like a, a resentful slave which hatefully serves and obeys out of obligation to their master. We love our master. We love our master. It is an honor. It is a blessing to be able to serve him, to call ourselves his servants. John 14, 21. We'll close with this text says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So this morning, this morning, let us pray together that Jesus, that Jesus will work on our hearts, that we will be able to submit to his lordship in our lives. A kingship which is so clearly declared in this text. And as we reflect on this passage, let's remember that Jesus', Jesus triumphal entry was not just a momentary spectacle. It was a sign of his true identity and mission. So let us also welcome him into our lives as our King and Savior, not just for a moment, but for eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we go today, Lord, I pray, let our love for you drive us to faithfulness, to true surrender to the truth of who Christ is and the salvation he brings. 
Let us love your son and be his faithful servants. Lord, if, if there's anyone here today, to those of us today who have not surrendered our lives over to you and follow Jesus, I ask you, O oh God, press upon their hearts. Pull them into your grasp. Pull us all closer to you. Let us know you and be known by you, O oh God. Give us faithfulness. Give us a heart which longs for you, O oh God. Bless us to get today as we go. Let us go out and do the ministry of Christ. We pray this together in the name of the Son and by the Spirit. Amen. You are sent. Be blessed and bless others.